Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to another session of the AI Journal Club. Um, my name is Dan Cohen. I'm a third year resident at SUNY Downstate, New York. Um, as for today's agenda, um, we're going to present the article for the first 30 minutes, and then we'll have the discussion for the remaining half an hour. The session is going to be recorded online and is going to be available on this link. And you're always welcome to tweet along a uh, hashtag Rad AI Journal Club. Um, now, as for the discussion, everyone is encouraged to participate. Um, you can write a question in the question box on the Go webinar, and I could ask a question on your behalf later on. In regard of the advisory council, um, it is perhaps a good uh, occasion also to introduce new members. Um, as many residents from the previous council recently became attending, we have uh, new talented resident, residents with us. So Lindsay Shea, which was on the previous advisory council, is still with us. She's a PGY5 resident at Indiana University. Jeff Woody, a new radiology fellow at UCSF. Teresa Martin Carreras from UPenn. And Cyrus Saidipu from Kansas. And Atif Irmath uh, from Maryland. Um, so the prior team is still helping us and leading us behind the scene, actually. That's obviously including Judy Gishar. Um, so that's, that's regarding the team. Now, as for today, the Panelists are going to present the article um, Automated Deep Learning Design for Medical Image Classification by Healthcare Professionals with No Coding Experience, a feasibility study. And just as a side note, uh, one of the reasons we are meeting at 1 p.m. today is because we are thankful to have with us the authors of the article, which are actually on the other side of the Atlantic from uh, the UK and Switzerland. Um, the authors are coming from the ophthalmology domain, and it's perhaps a good example to show mm. how the journal club is about sharing knowledge among all the professional disciplines. So we're happy to have with us um, Dr. Pierce Keen, who is a fellow of the Royal College of Ophthalmology, a member of the Royal College of Surgeon of Ireland, and is a consultant ophthalmologist at Moorfield Eye Hospital and a clinical a clinician scientist at the National Institute of Health Research at the um, University College of London, the Institute of Ophthalmology. And Livia uh, Faiz, who is a resident at Cantonal Hospital Lucerne in uh, Switzerland. And she's an honorary research fellow at the Moorfield High Hospital in uh, London. And lastly, Siegfried Wagner, who is uh, an academic clinical fellow at the National Institute for Health Research, also at Moorfield Eye Hospital and the University College of London. Um, so just as a side note, I, I personally found this article excellent, uh, thanks to its transparency and how it elaborated exactly what was done, even including like a small explanatory video online. Um, we found this article especially relevant to today as we're trying to democratize AI tools among the healthcare community. So without saying too much, uh, this article is presenting how physicians with no coding experience use automated deep learning technologies to perform image classification. And I'm going to pass the presentation to Siegfried. Oh. Oh, how do I screen? Oh, we're just um, sharing our screen at the moment. Uh, so while while Secret is just figuring out um, how to do that, um, let me just. Tell, talk a little bit more about the background to this uh, this study. So, um, you know, 
first of all, I'd like to say, uh, Dan, it's, it's really, um, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. And it's, uh, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great honor here. For, uh, it's really exciting as an ophthalmologist to be speaking to a group of non-ophthalmologists. And um, Sigrid, are we? Um, I think we have to restart the app. Okay. So, um, and we're just having a technical issue here, which is that it says uh, we might have to restart the GoToMeeting app. Oh. And and we're just worried if we do, you know, we're we're gonna uh, we're gonna cut you off. Uh, I'll redial it. Yeah. So. Can we maybe if we can be back in thirty seconds or so, and okay. then we'll be able to share. This. Okay, I, I guess we can try uh, that. Yes, we're okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're in. Okay. Are we back? And can we share the screen now? I can definitely hear you guys. Screen. Show my screen. Yeah, I, I think we're nearly there. So we can show. And then. I can see the screen. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay, we were, we were panicking a little bit there. Um, so, um, so let let me. Um, my, the the plan would be. I'm I'm just going to give a um, a, mi a minute or two of background to how this uh, paper came about, and then Siegfried is going to give the actual presentation, and then we can all take the the questions afterwards. Um, but the background is that um, I've been involved in AI research, um, in particular deep learning research for ophthalmic imaging, since since about 2015. And um, I should tell you that my background is as an ophthalmologist. Uh, I don't have any computer science or any engineering background. But in around 2013 or 2014, I was, you know, interested in new technologies and, you know, hearing about the advances with uh, ImageNet in 2012, and you know, reading all these kind of media articles about the the breakthroughs afforded by deep learning, and become and became very excited about the the possibilities of that. In ophthalmology, and and so in a, about the middle of 2015, uh, I was reading a, a, an article in Wired UK magazine, uh, a profile of the company DeepMind, and uh, in that profile, it highlighted the fact that two of the three co-founders from DeepMind are um, from London, and two of the three co-founders are alumni of University College London, which is the University that Moorfields Eye Hospital is affiliated with, and so in that article it mentions that um, you know that DeepMind were interested in applying their algorithms to healthcare, to climate change, to energy, and the like. And so you know that was a kind of eureka moment for me when when I um, basically tracked down the the contact details of Mustafa Suleiman, the co-founder on on LinkedIn, and and sent him a message that initiated this formal collaboration between Moorfields and DeepMind. Now, that has then led to this multi-year collaboration with DeepMind and, and more recently with Google Health um, around applying deep learning to these optical coherence tomography or OCT scans, which are now the dominant form of imaging in, in all of ophthalmology. Now, in that time, we've learned a lot about uh, applying deep learning in healthcare um, and so really what I've learned a lot about is, you know, how to identify, um, you know, use, novel use cases for uh, different, diff different types of machine learning. I've learned how to aggregate and curate ophthalmic imaging data at scale because we ended up sharing about 1.2 million anonymized retrospective OCT scans with DeepMind. And, and of course, that's a very, very big undertaking. And we've learned a lot about how to work with engineers and computer scientists from DeepMind and from Google 
um, uh, in terms of evaluating mo model performance. And now we're thinking a lot about actually doing clinical trials and doing proper validation of these algorithms so that they can actually be translated into real use. Now, the reason that I'm telling you all this is because we've learned a lot about, a lot about the process, but ultimately I don't have any you know, detailed technical expertise. And so a part of me has always been kind of a little bit almost in awe of um, some of the senior scientists that I've interacted with at DeepMind or in academic settings, you know, people like Olaf Ronneberger and, and Jeff Defoe, who, who just almost have these superpowers in terms of like their ability to, to train these models. And so with that being the case, then it was very exciting for me in the end, towards the end of November 2017, when I read an article in the New York Times by Cade Metz, which was called Building AI That Can Build AI. And it was just the first time that I had read this description of these automated deep learning platforms. And so the, art, the, the type described in that article is, was predominantly AutoML from Google Cloud, but of course there are others from Baidu and Amazon and Apple and Microsoft and, and, and some smaller companies. And so for me as a clinician, this was kind of like such an exciting thing because it, it kind of gave this kind of tantalizing um, opportunity to, to somehow begin to train these models. And so when I read about this, I then initiated this collaboration or, or not initiated this collaboration, I, I spoke to Siegfried and Livia and other members of the research group and I said, you know, we got to explore this. And so Siegfried will talk you through the details, but the amazing thing was that we actually started to get some good results. Now, of course, the thing that we've tried to illustrate in our article, and I think it will come out a lot in the discussion, is that this could be very powerful and it could democratize a lot of, um, uh, you know, these, uh, the development of these models. But of course, there are loads of caveats to this. And there's loads of reasons why we need to be careful and cautious and thoughtful before we just, you know, allow people without any technical expertise to start to develop these things. Um, so in any event, that's just a, a short background and I'm going to hand over to Siegfried now to, to talk us through the presentation. Okay, so I'm just going to get started now um, with the background to the paper, but before that, just to talk about some disclosures for this study. Uh, Pierce and I are both funded by the National Institute for Health Research and we have earmarked funding by a, a grant from Moorfield's Eye Charity to actually look into automated machine learning. <laughs> Finally, as you've heard, we have a collaboration with Google Health, although they have not had any involvement in the conception design of this study. So if you're attending this talk, then presumably you have an interest in artificial intelligence, particularly in healthcare. So I'll go over this slide very quickly, just to very quickly say that obviously there's been an explosion in deep learning research, and particularly over the last decade, even though it's been around for much longer than that. This is just a, a report from the AI index, which I'd encourage everyone interested in artificial intelligence to, to look through. It's published annually by Stanford University. And it just shows that particularly since 2005 or so, um, research into the areas including neural networks and computer vision has increased and we've seen this a lot in healthcare with really bold claims being made that um, some of the neural networks designed are uh, at the same level as uh, human doctors or indeed exceeding their expertise and these are just some of the hyped articles that you'll see. The problem is that to actually conduct deep learning, as Pierce was alluding to, requires three main blockers if we think about the model development. Uh, one is that you need a large amount of data and you need this in a computationally tractable form. So data sets which can be, uh, you need pipelines which can essentially export these data sets to be analyzed through imaging software and plugged into learning models. And few centers have it in this sort of form or indeed the volume of data necessary. The second is that you need sufficient processing capacity um, uh, in the form generally of graphical processing units. Now that's been mitigated more recently by the availability of a lot of cloud-based GPUs that you can actually rent uh, online. 
And the third thing that we're focusing on in this paper is that proper deep learning expertise to design a model from the ground up requires significant training. Um, and, uh, and this is uh, something that we, we benefit from with uh, collaboration, but within more fields ourselves, uh, less so. So to facilitate that final process, one option is something called transfer learning, which I'm sure everyone will be familiar with. And this essentially a model that has been used for a different purpose is, re is repurposed and used as a baseline for new model creation. And many people will know about the ImageNet challenge in 2012 when Jeffrey Hinton's group uh, uh, presented AlexNet and it had a huge uh, step in improvement of performance on the challenge. And since then, we find that many of the papers published using AI and healthcare, or at least in medical imaging, often use some form of transfer learning. Another option that emerged really towards the end of 2016, early 2017, is this idea of something called neural architecture search. Now, I'm not a computer scientist, so I won't go into the full details, but essentially this is a form of automating actual um, the neural architecture engineering. So you can actually use a neural network to uh, identify the most appropriate model architecture for a given data set. And you can see that this starts to simplify the process of model development. So following on from that, there have been a number of vendors, some from very large companies you'll see here, some from smaller independent groups that have uh, created these automated machine learning platforms where you can essentially um, uh, upload your data set and train a model yourself. And they, have, they require variable degrees of coding. So some of them might require uh, a few months of experience in Python or R, some of the most common machine learning programming languages. Others are very much drag and drop um, uh, platforms. Now we focused on Google's AutoML, so Cloud Vision, mainly because this was one of the first ones available. This is, you see, from early 2018, which is around the time we started this study. And also, if you had registered for the, the beta, it was a, it was a free um, platform to use. So this is the one we focused on, and I'm, we're going to be talking about that. And in particular, I'm going to try and talk about the actual a granular level of detail so that anyone who's listening or people uh, watching the recording can actually do it themselves. So obviously using data, patient data, has lots of information governance and data privacy uh, ramifications. So to obviate that, we used open source publicly available data sets. First data set was a well-known data set called the Mesidor uh, retinal photography data set. And this is essentially a data set looking at diabetic retinopathy, which has been graded by several ophthalmologists. The second was one on optical coherence tomography. So just to briefly talk about that, this is a, uh, a retinal imaging type that uses a, a near infrared light. And it's really transformed ophthalmology over the last decade or two decades, giving high resolution images at the back of the eye. I'll talk more about that data set in a little bit. We then looked at respiratory data sets. So a pediatric chest X-ray data set that also comes from uh, Daniel Kamani et al's team at the, uh, in, a, in a cell publication, along with the previous OCT, and the well-known National Institute for Health chest X-ray 14 data set. And then finally, we used two dermatoscopic image data sets, the Human Against Machine 10,000 data set, this is provided by the University of Vienna, and then the Edinburgh Dermafit data set, slightly smaller, uh, data set of about 1300 images. So just to give you an idea of the level of, of competence, this was done by uh, Livia Faze and myself, um, and we have very, we have no coding experience really. And it, I'd say to take about approximately 10 hours of training preparation time each. And just to give you an idea of what that time entailed, it entailed some basic competence training in shell script. And the main reason for that is so that you can upload large data sets, which are spanning, you know, tens or hundreds of gigabytes into a Google Cloud uh, uh, bucket. OK, you can actually drag and drop these. But if you think of doing 100,000 images, uh, it's not really pragmatic. 
So it was to learn some basic shell script to do that. The second is to uh, allocate your images into its, its, its various training, tuning, and test data sets. And I'll talk a little bit about that later on. And obviously we wanted to do this in a random setting. So we assigned a random number function um, in something uh, in, in Excel to uh, identify which image goes into which data set. The exception with that is the OCT data set from Kamani, the reason being that that is patient specific. So the training and the validation data has multiple images per patient, whereas the test set, none of those patients are in the training or validation set. So we wanted to respect that segregation. The other thing to learn about was, of course, just the general principles of the AutoML documentation on Google Cloud Vision. From our computer. I'm actually going to turn the sound off here. This is just a, a co-author, Eddie Corot, and this is the supplementary video, which some of you uh, may have seen online. And I'm just going to talk through the interface here. This is the interface of the beta of AutoML Vision. Uh, it's recently changed, but looks very similar. And you'll see that here we have these OCT retinal images, just over 100,000, uploaded into our given uh, AutoML project. You can see on the left that all images here have been labeled. Uh, and none are unlabeled, and they're into their four different categories, CNV, DME, Drusen, and Normal. You can select the images, you can change the label uh, to one that's been previously described, or you can just uh, um, actually upload its own uh, label, which is what we did to, to, be, to, to sort of make the process more streamlined. You can then train your model on this data based on the labels you've provided, and you can, you've got an option here of one or 24 hours, and this may evolve into more customizable timelines. The training will actually level off, and this isn't entirely clear how many iterations it undergoes or epochs it undergoes, but the model training will essentially level off when the accuracy is no longer improving. And we trained all our models for 24 hours. Here you'll see that a model that we've already trained, and this is the confusion matrix for that model, um, which is given down in percentages per label. And you can adjust the confidence threshold, which is, is, is defaulted at 0 0.50 for, uh, for the labels. What's really helpful about a platform like this is your ability to see your true positives, your false positives, in general, all your misclassifications, especially as a clinician, because you can start to identify those when perhaps the labeling was inaccurate, or you can at least start to understand why the model has made the decision it has. And I'll give you a, a few examples of that later on. Finally, there's this prediction tab at the end, which allows you to input single images. You can drag a few, uh, and you can see the actual model's prediction for that particular image. Now, you can see that's quite helpful. That's for a single image, but if you wanted to actually do systematic large scale external validation of a data set, that would be more challenging. Now, as well as using open source publicly available data sets for information governance reasons, another one is that some of you will have heard of these data sets and they're well known in the machine learning world. And we, want, we wanted to see how it compares to current state of the art models at that time. Um, so we did a, a search in all the major search libraries, uh, such as Embase and Web of Science, uh, looking at deep learning, but also the data sets uh, that we've tested out, the five data sets, to see what the current best performing model performance was. Now, many of you will be familiar with the conventional split sample validation of deep learning uh, uh, projects, but just to go through this, we, we, we randomly split our samples into training, tuning, and and test sets. And that was done in a 80% training, 10% tuning, and 10% internal validation test set. As I said, in, in, in all the data sets, this was random, uh, randomly allocated images apart from the OCT data set from Kamani. And that was to respect that there were patients uh, who had contributed to the test set were not in the training set. Now, to really robustly validate your model, ideally you need to perform some degree of external validation. And while that's quite hard here, we try to emulate that in our dermatoscopic imaging data set. We use the larger data set, the uh, human against machine 10,000 data set for training and tuning. And then we, uh, we uploaded a second data set, the Edinburgh Dermafit as a test data set um, to see how it performs in external validation. 
So now just going into the results. So the first challenge, uh, the most basic task would be binary classification. And we had two data sets for that. The first one here is the Mesador data set, and this is diabetic retinopathy or not. Um, now, the gradings of these images is actually provided in, uh, in more fine detail, the actual level of diabetic retinopathy. But most papers will compare either referable diabetic retinopathy, so that which needs to be seen by, a, uh, by an ophthalmologist versus that that's not referable, or it will identify um, the presence of diabetic retinopathy or absence, which is what we, we, we looked at. And you'll see here that um, our, our performance metrics, and actually for a binary classifier, it was perhaps not as effective as the one I'll, I'll talk about in a second. You know, we're ophthalmologists, so we're able to actually interrogate the images that have been um, misclassified in a way. And here's just an example um, of some images that are graded as normal. And, you know, even as an ophthalmologist, it can be very challenging to identify some features of diabetic retinopathy in these images. I'm not sure if you're able to see my mouse cursor, but there's perhaps some evidence here. But just, just in that one image, but just to mention that something like the presence of diabetic retinopathy can be due to a single small hemorrhage that uh, really is, you know, on the image a size of a grain of sand. So you can understand where the model may have difficulty. There are other issues where Another feature of diabetic retinopathy can be yellow light deposits, which are called exudates. And in some images here, there are yellow light deposits, you'll see, uh, which are not exudates, but there are perhaps not enough images in this data set, one could infer, that have this appearance or have exudates for the model to be able to distinguish between yellow spots, which are exudates, and yellow spots, which might be something else. Now, our second binary classification task was a pediatric chest X-ray data set, and that's provided by um, Kamani et al. In the, in the paper in Cell. And this is, again, a binary classification between normal and pneumonia of about 5,000 images. And in this, the, the model performed very well. As you'll see, there were six false positives and 10 false negatives with an area under the precision recall curve of, of, of one really. Now, I, I realize I'm talking to radiologists here, so I'm not going to comment on the labels in this scenario, but just to give you an idea of some of the images that were incorrectly predicted as normal um, when actually the label was uh, pneumonia. I mean, the, the image in the top left, I mean, would, you would say the, the, the magnification is quite different to a lot of the other images. Um, and I'm going to, yes, I'm not going to comment on the bottom right, but um, Apart from that, uh, this was labeled as a, a pneumonia case. So the, the natural next step would be to look at a multiple classification. So just to be clear, that's you have more than two uh, uh, classifications, and you're looking for the model to predict a, a single classification from an image. So looking first at our OCT data set, so this is the retinal imaging, again from Kamani et al. There are four labels in this data set for OCT images. This is a normal retinal scan uh, showing the different layers uh, at the back of the eye. You'll notice that there are these little small um, clear uh, elevations in that hyper-reflective white layer at the back. These are called drusen, and this can be a feature of dry age-related macular degeneration. So this was the second label. The third label was um, diabetic macular edema. And um, you'll notice this looks quite different, but in particular, there are these black or hyper-reflective spaces um, within the retina throughout. And then we have choroidal neovascularization, the most common form of which is, is wet, age-related macular generation. And you'll see that in comparison to the previous photo, there are these large uh, black uh, circular spaces or hyper-reflective spaces within the retina, but also features in the lower part of the retina as well. So these are the four labels within the Kamani data set. And in this data set, our, the model performed very well, actually, um, uh, with, a, with an area under the precision recall curve of 0.99. And you'll, if you look at the metrics here or in the paper, you'll notice that the false positives and false negatives are very low, the one exception being the Drusen versus other categories where the false negatives um, was 23. And it's important to mention this idea of, of, of or some would term it spectrum bias, where you have different severities of a given disease. Drusen is a feature of age-related macular degeneration, and patients with dry age-related macular degeneration can, can transform into a wet form. 
So when looking at the images, you can see that many of the Drusen, those which are labeled as Drusen, have been misclassified as crawdal neovascularization, which is often wet macular degeneration. Um, just to give you an idea of, of some of the misclassifications above is, is an image of diabetic macular edema in the data set, and below is a case of crawdal neovascularization, which was incorrectly classified as diabetic macular edema. So our second multiple classification data set was the dermatoscopic images from the Human Against Machine 10,000 data set provided by the University of Vienna. So this is seven different labels, um, so becoming a bit more challenging uh, compared to the previous task. Uh, seven different labels uh, with the vast majority of images being uh, nevus. So around 70% of the images are nevus category. And here again, you'll notice the metrics were, were reasonable and comparable to what had been published at the time on this data set. So after going, so from going to a multiple classification task, we went to a multi-label classification. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that you, in this scenario, we've got 14 labels and multiple labels can be predicted from a single image. So in this example, you might, uh, upload a chest x-ray image and it would predict not just pleural effusion but also pneumothorax, atelectasis, cardiomegaly um, per image. So obviously this is a, a much more challenging task and, and, and this, this shows in the performance metrics. So some reasonable positive predictive value but in general the model was, uh, was not as um, high performing as in the other scenario. Now, as I said, we're ophthalmologists, so I'm not going to comment, but, but I'm going to uh, uh, just mention because the chest x-ray 14 data set is a well-known data set, which many of you may recall that uh, um, the, the group at Stanford, Andrew Ung's group at Stanford, had published a big paper showing um, comparable performance in their deep learning model to uh, radi radiologists. But uh, one of the comments that uh, the uh, so some of you may know Luke Oakton Rayner has commented on is that fact that uh, is the labeling of the data. So for example, here is a, a case which was misclassified as a pneumothorax and interesting this patient has some sort of um, drain or some sort of lead across the chest and what you find in many of the pneumothorax images in the chest x-ray 14 data set is that they have a chest drain present. So one can hypothesize that this is affecting or this is biasing the model in some way. And then there becomes, just focusing on labels again, there becomes this debate of nodule versus mass where this image is, label, is, is actually labeled as a nodule in the data set, but then gets predicted as mass by the model. Um, something to consider. So finally, those, so those are our three data sets. And as I mentioned before, one thing that any, any um, predictive modeling uh, researcher wants to do is externally validate the model to see how generalized, what the generalizability of it is like. And uh, we're fortunate that we were able to do this with the dermatoscopic image data set. So as I said, we use the HAM 10,000 data set to actually train and tune a model. And then we externally validate it on, it, uh, validate it on the Edinburgh Dermafit data set, which has 1,300 images. Um, uh, and here are the metrics for that. And what you'll know in general is that the external validation was um, the area under the precision recall curve was 0.47. So really not a particularly impressive performance in this scenario. What you might also notice, and I'll, I'll, I'll just point to you, is, is the Nevis category. So the Nevis category, uh, the specificity here is about 39%, whereas the specificity for all the other groups is, is quite high. So we started wondering, well, what's going on with the Nevis category? And as I alluded to before, one thing you find when you compare the HAM 10,000 data set to the Dermafit data set is that Nevis accounts for 75% of the images in the HAM 10,000 data set, but only 39% in the Dermafit uh, data set. And this, 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 this starts to suggest some idea of class imbalance. And for those who aren't familiar, this is really the idea that your, your, your predictive model is trained on a distribution of data that is not representative of the population in which it may be used or invalidated in this scenario. So just to, as a proof of principle, one option here is to do something called undersampling. So reduce the amount of nevises within the uh, training and tuning data set, which is what we tried to do. So we actually removed 3000 nevis cases 
um, from the training and tuning data set uh, and then performed an external validation again. But actually, this didn't seem to affect the model particularly. Now, whether one should make sure that the validation actually has um, uh, class distributions that reflect the training and tuning data set in automated machine learning is something that we may be looking into in the future. So I've not gone in detail into the limitations because this will be uh, more for the discussion, but just to mention some of the, 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 the large themes that we came across when of limitations when using automated machine learning. As you saw that we were able to comment on some of the ophthalmic images that were misclassified, but really only attempted to do this in chest X-ray or even dermatoscopic images. And one of the issues here is a, is a lack of interpretability. So we're not really able to see why the model is making a decision here, uh, why it makes the decision uh, it does. And this is perhaps something that we'll see in future uh, versions or future iterations of automated machine learning. Now, uh, we're not able to see what sort of model architecture is chosen. Um, uh, so it very much does remain uh, that, that, that cliche phrase of a black box in, in automated machine learning. You'll notice that most of the metrics here, we have, we have transformed from what is provided in, in the platform to more conventional metrics like sensitivity and specificity, but these are not typically provided in the uh, interface. So precision and recall, uh, the more common uh, measures in uh, computer science are provided and the area under the precision recall curve, but not actual uh, sensitivity and specificity. The data sets have their own limitations, uh, which is um, important to acknowledge, and that can be either the labels, that can be that there's not a clear enough description of the actual inclusion criteria of the patients. And then the, the current state when we were looking at the beta of automated machine learning had very limited capability of doing a systematic external validation. By that I mean we are not able to drag or upload 2,000 images and look at how the model performs in that. We have to actually do that as the test data set um, uh, in the outset. So, so this is something again that hopefully will be available in the next sort of uh, iterations. Papers available, it's open source, so uh, it's openly available. So um, this is the link. And if you wanted to read more, uh, the supplementary video is on there as well. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much for this um, amazing presentation. That was actually much well more expensive than the article itself. So. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, let me see if we have some questions because I, I do have a few questions to ask you guys. Uh, Siegfried, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we're we're all here actually. Yeah. Um, so just a small question, and you, you mentioned it in the limitations, um, that there is different ways to report the statistical results. And like even in the article, it was written the discrepancy where there's like a, AUC AUC curves and versus AUC uh, peer curves. So my question for you is, um, let's maybe bring, bring the question for the need of the standards. And I was wondering what what is your thoughts about it? If you have uh, if you met any standards so far, and like if you can elaborate more about how like you think we should assess like uh, the metrics. Like I'm asking as clinicians, sometimes it's uh, for us to know how to validate the information. So I think you're you're exactly right. There's this there's this real discrepancy in that many computer science or deep learning papers will report on things like precision and recall uh, and the area under the precision recall curve, whereas clinicians are much more um, accustomed to the sensitivity, the specificity. Um, and uh, we actually have a colleague uh, who, along with Livia, has recently performed a systematic review and looked into this and found that there's a huge heterogeneity in this across different papers. And probably what's most helpful is if confusion matrices are provided. Um, so actual levels of true positive, true negative, 
false, positive and negative. And then you can actually um, calculate your own uh, sensitivity specificity metrics. Mm -hmm. And this is something we had to do in the automated machine learning paper um, uh, to calculate our own, because once you get a confusion matrix of multiple labels, it can become very difficult to actually uh, to, to do that. I mean, does that answer your question? Uh, some no, degree? It, it does. It, 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 like, it's definitely just uh, enforcing, um, like, at least I'm aware of this discrepancy, and, and I see it with different lists of these different metrics. And I think you had even like a recent article, like the meta analysis of post performance recently that is also expressing this problem, but I don't, I don't have yet the solution. Um, I'm just, I think, expressing the problem. I think um, the, the the key point is that um, for ultimately for the translation of deep learning and other as other types of ma ma machine learning to healthcare, that clinicians have to be central to that, and we have to in we have to insist on clinically meaningful metrics to assess the validity of the algorithms. So I, I think it's inevitable that we'll move in that direction as clinical translation continues. No, I, I, I definitely agree because, as you said, like if, if we want to clinician without experience how to understand these um, metrics, they, they need like a common language. And um, so, yeah, so that was one of the questions. Let me see if there is any other question from the audience, meanwhile. Um, Um, Dan, um, yep. one of the things, maybe while we're waiting for questions, um, it would be interesting to pass on some of the comments that we received during the review process. And um, in particular, um, there was, there was uh, a degree of skepticism from some machine learning reviewers, which, which I think is appropriate. Um, but one of the things that made me, made me smile at least was that um, the editors of the journal in the revision process did ask us to, make, to, to, be, to be clear that we weren't suggesting that we were going to replace AI experts completely with this. And, and of course, the reason that made me smile is because over the last three or four years, I, I've been in a situation where every time I give a talk, the inevitable question of will AI replace doctors um, starts to surface. And I've had to sort of try and justify or explain why things are not quite as simple as that. And so I think it's, it's, it's the very mirror image of that when we talk about will these platforms replace AI experts. No, that, that's definitely a big question, and at least in the radiology field, it's like there's a lot of articles which are like asking. But I think the more we, we learn about it, more we, we understand it's like much more sophisticated than like this. Like he was showing the example of the multi label with X ray, and no, I, I, I agree for you for with you for now, but um, I, I had another question if uh, because the article was done in 2018 by now and if you had, if you met like any new automated deep learning platforms that um, are perhaps better to use today and where we can actually batch and use like external validations um, and test better with it or i'm not sure if you understand my question well um so so I think I think so. So I mean, actually, in that short period of time, the the Google AutoML platform has already um, been um, modified and improved quite a lot. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're not just. Um, although we have um, close links with Google and with DeepMind, we're not just looking at that platform. And so we've actually started um, studies now where we take the same five medical image data sets, and we, we're, we're looking at um, seeing how what, what the performance of models will be 
on all of the other platforms, whether it be uh, Baidu, Easy Deep Learning, Amazon SageMaker, Apple Create ML, and probably a, a couple of others, uh, Platform.ai, and Clarify, and, and a couple of others. So, but, but the thing is, uh, as with our previous study, um, I think it would be very easy for us just to go and train a load of models, but I think the nice thing from my perspective working with Siegfried and Livia and others is that we're, we're trying to adopt a thoughtful approach to the evaluation of diagnostic accuracy so that we can actually have a fair comparison between the, the different models um, and you know, not necessarily just rushing in to, to publish something uh, prematurely. Oh, great. Uh, that's a good point. Um, okay. And, and then in terms uh, of... Dan, another... Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. Well, I, I, there was just one other point that I really wanted to try to highlight to the listeners, which is I think that People have jumped to the conclusion um, that, uh, you know, we would suggest that somehow doctors with no coding experience should train a deep learning system and then start to use this on patients. And we're, what we're saying is um, no, nobody is talking about that anytime soon. There's lots and lots of cautions around, uh, around using this in life. It would be many years before you could actually go through the appropriate validation and approvals before you could use it in, in real life. And we would say there's lots of reasons to be cautious about using bespoke state-of-the-art deep learning models in real patients. And so we should be doubly cautious or triply cautious if we're talking about automated deep learning platforms. However, I think what we're excited about is that there seems to be so many applications in clinical research where we could um, use this tool for our betterment. So for example, imagine a situation where um, we've somehow um, been given a data set of 10,000 retinal photographs, but we don't know which are from left eyes or from right eyes, or we don't know which are centered on the macula or which are centered on the optic nerve. You could easily imagine a situation where we could use a platform like this to train a classifier for left or right eye sorting. And then we could somehow kind of um, ease the process of doing this work um, and not have to do what we, what we would do at the moment, which is just like, you know, get a medical student or get a junior doctor to look at 10,000 images and go through the labels. And so we can imagine, I think, a kind of like, you know, creation of a clinical research toolkit for ophthalmology um, that would be facilitated by this. Or we could imagine um, beginning to develop to, to use tools, for example, to do point, point of care clinical trial recruitment. So maybe we could like train an algorithm to identify patients with dry age-related macular degeneration on a retinal photograph. And that, you know, uh, this, this tool could be used that it would just give a little flag to a clinician to say, this patient may be eligible for this clinical trial on the basis purely of their, of their images. So, so I, I, I can't uh, emphasize enough how excited we are about the potential of this technology to kind of democratize uh, some of these clinical tools. Uh, th thank you. That, that's a great comment. And you also mentioned about um, potential um, early research with clinical implication, like clinical um, um, like research that, that is be being performed in more fields. Do, do you want to elaborate more about what is being done right now? Or? You, you mean in relation to the automated deep learning in particular? Yeah, and how to implement it today. Um, if, if you even try to do some clinical um, implementations. Well, I think, um, so we're, 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 I think quite far away from implementing clinically any of these automated uh, 
uh, models. So we're still learning, we're still in the very early learning stage. I think some of the, some of the separate work that I'm doing with Google and others is a, with bespoke deep learning models is, is a little bit more moving towards the implementation phase. But I think what we're doing in more fields at the moment in regard to automated deep learning is that we are going through the information governance processes at more fields um, mm -hmm. so that we can actually begin to use uh, anonymized uh, uh, OCT scans from more fields to train, uh, to, to use on some of these automated deep learning platforms. So we're completing our, our data protection impact assessments and, and the like so that we can have a robust, uh, trustworthy system in place. And the reason we're excited about that is because, you know, I think that with the publicly available data sets, that the, some of the data sets were not necessarily the largest, and uh, a lot of the labels are quite noisy with those data sets. So we feel that we can probably get, a, you know, quite a big uh, uh, increment in, in performance just by having uh, much higher quality data sets from our own institution once we've got the information governance approvals to do that. Okay, sure. okay. okay so as you said, we're still far, far away from, from there. Um, I just as, as a side note, like uh, I, I was having a bit of trouble to see the questions of the attendee and that like I was working on it. So it's a um, B. Balen, which is as uh, a chair of the ACL DSI lab, just wanted to mention that uh, um, so the DSI is a data science institute of the American College of Radiology. And we have like a, um, so it, so it's like a tool which is called AI lab, which is a bit similar, which is a, essentially a platform for radiologists to upload the studies, um, which is ma made similar to the auto machine learning and and I think it's it's also like a, like a way that the radiology is trying to I think to democratize more information and by, by making these tools. And yes, so um, I I think I I wonder if we're entering a phase with deep learning which is moving towards the democratization and the industrialization of deep learning because it seems to me now that. Um, we we probably don't need to make a, a lot of breakthroughs on the fundamental kind of um, computer science aspects if we have um, you know large data sets we've got good computing power and more importantly we've got the kind of appropriate ethical and information governance approvals to allow us to use those data sets I feel that you know we can we'll be busy for the next five or ten years in actually kind of um, the, doing the applied clinical research for, uh, for these things. And this, the second point I would make is that, um, to my mind, if we can empower healthcare professionals, um, you know, to start to think about these models, we'll find, um, you know, hundreds of new potential use cases. Because I think that if you leave it just to, um, to a non-medic to develop these models, then I think that they would tend to focus on optimizing the same things. Whereas I think, um, you know, clinicians, I think, will will just just generate lots and lots of ideas. And so um, to me, this is this is exciting in, in the same way that like introducing the personal computer in the late 70s and early 80s was. And and so at that time, you have a situation where um, people found the idea of a personal computer very um, kind of crazy and and at the time people in the in the mainstream computing industry were saying well why would anybody want a personal computer in their own home we, you know they would say well we use we use mainframe computers to calculate the payrolls for big corporations so why would anybody want a personal computer and moreover the personal computers that we're talking about are actually are very very limited in what they can do but but like i say Within a year or so of personal computers being available, you'd have you'd have um, people coming up with a myriad of different applications, and so I wonder if uh, automated deep learning may be something uh, along similar lines. Hmm. That's that's a really um, that's a really good point. 
I guess we'll see with time uh, where it goes. And I, I finally succeeded to find how to use um, the questions on the dashboard. Uh, so I have like two uh, small questions and I'll try to be fast in the interest of the time. Uh, so we have a question from Dogan uh, Polat, and which I'm, I'm reading for this study, you have worked with public data sets. So in this question case, so in this case questions, you can ask an, an hypothesis size, and you can test on naturally, your test are naturally limited. Also, it seems hard to upload local data to this platform, even through it is a fully anonymized. Is there a way to overcome this problem or work locally without uploading? So, um, so is the question around the challenges of getting the approvals for using your own data sets, or is it the more the technical problems with uploading a large data set? Like if you had like 10 terabytes of images, how would you upload those things? Or maybe a combination of both those questions. So let me just see um, the first one. Yeah, so I think that the most important thing is the information governance side. You, you, you really shouldn't go and start to upload images from your own institution without going through some sort of robust approval process to make sure that um, you know, uh, your institution knows what you're doing, you have the appropriate ethics approvals, and that you're not, you know, you're not doing anything inappropriate with, with patient data, and particularly if there's a potential that you're not anonymizing the data correctly or other issues. So in the UK, we have systems around that, and um, the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK advises that we complete detailed data protection impact assessments where we actually describe the processing of the data. And we also have to complete inf information security checklists and, and cloud security checklists so that we, we actually you know, describe in detail the, the cloud-based systems that we would be uploading the data to. Now, fortunately in the UK, in 2018, NHS Digital, the, uh, the national organization for digital work in, in the UK uh, on the National Health Service, gave recommend, recommendations, national guidance that supported the use of cloud-based infrastructure for, um, for patient data. And so there is an existing framework in the UK for this, uh, for this to be uh, to be used. Yeah. Okay. And another question from um, Jonathan Liu, which which is asking uh, if you can clarify why we can't upload testing image afterward instead of including them in a predefined testing set. I think what is what he's asking. Um, if I'm not mistaken, he's asking about why do we need to have an external validation? Yeah. Um, so, so the question is, why do we need to perform external validation? I, if, if I understand this question properly, yes. Which I think you can, yeah, you, you, you can okay. explain us better. So I, I think that um, so validation of a model predates deep learning and is something that has been done in, in traditional statistical models for you know probably longer than decades. And the idea being that you want to see how well your model that you develop generalizes to a separate data set. We might, for example, create a model on more fields-based data and then use it in another population and actually find that simply because the the, the number of pixels or the, the image resolution is slightly different in the population we're trying to use the model in, it gets every prediction wrong. So really to, to, to get an idea of some degree of generalizability, you need to perform an external validation. Um, and you know that's something we'd highly recommend in, in any scenario, especially in deep learning. Yeah, I, I think we're, we're very aware that some of these deep, many of these deep learning models are quite brittle. And, and so 
I think in everything that we've tried to do, we've tried to kind, we've tried to combine our enthusiasm and excitement for this for this technology with also a kind of like cautious skepticism, and uh, and to make sure that um, you know we really try and look for what is the best possible validation of these algorithms before we ever think about using them in directly in patients. No, I, and, I, and I definitely agree because I think also for different patient populations in different places which can be easily affected without external validation. So um, that's definitely. And uh, let me just, uh, if you don't mind, I, I will ask the um, like Catherine because of the interest of time. We're already, it's already 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. at um, in the UK. Um, let me see if there is any other questions. No, I, that, that's what it for the questions, and, and I think you, you have answered most of my questions actually. And um, so, is there is anything else you want to mention before we are finishing the session, or? I think that's it from us. Uh, we'd just like to thank you again for the opportunity to, to, to tell you about our work. And um, we really just want to encourage people to go out there and explore this, because we do think that this has great potential to democratize this technology. No, I, I agree. And th thank you so much also for taking the time to join us, especially uh, with a different time. Um, time. Um, and as you said, I'm just repeating, but I think it's like now to have an introduction that like people actually without the coding skills, which many many of the clinician of us don't have, uh, to know that there's now, now new platforms which can assist. And, and I think it's like opening new doors. So yeah, I, th I think we'll finish for today. And uh, again, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dan. Okay.